sighed and shook his head firmly. I has told you five or six times, and the third will be the last. I is never showing myself to human beings. Why ever not? If I do, they will be putting me in the zoo with all the jiggy rafts and catty piddlers. Nonsense. And they will be sending you straight back to a orphanage. Grown-up human beings is not famous for their kindnesses. They is all squiffle rotters and grink sludgers. That simply isn't true. Some of them are very kind indeed. Who? Name one. The Queen of England. You can't call her a squiffle rotter or a grink sludger. Well, hmm. Sophie was silent for a few moments. Then, suddenly, in a voice filled with excitement, she cried out, I've got it! By golly, I think I've got it! Got what? The answer! We'll go to the Queen. If I went and told the Queen about these disgusting man-eating giants, I'm sure she'd do something about it. The BFG looked down at her sadly and shook his head. She is never believing you. Never in a month of Mondays. I think she would. Never. It is sounding such a wonky tall story. The Queen will be laughing and saying, what awful rub squash. She would not. Of course she would. I has told you before that human beings is simply not believing in giants. Now, hold on a sec. Just you hold on a sec, because I've got another idea. Oh, your ideas is full of crodswoggle. Not this one. You say that if we tell the Queen, she would never believe us. I am certain she wouldn't. But we aren't going to tell her. We don't have to tell her. We'll make her dream it. Oh, that is an even more froth-bungling suggestion. You is only believing in a dream while you was actually dreaming it. But as soon as you was waking up, you were saying, Oh, oh, it was only a dream. Don't you worry about that part of it. I can fix that. Never can you fix it. I can, I swear I can. But first of all, let me ask you a very important question. Here it is. Can you make a person dream absolutely anything in the world? <laughs> anything you like. If I said I wanted to dream that I was in a flying bathtub with silver wings, could you make me dream it? I could. But how? You obviously don't have exactly that dream in your collection. I do not, but I could soon be mixing it up. How could you mix it up? <laughs> it's a bit like mixing a cake. If you is putting the right amounts of all the different things into it, you is making the cake come out any way you want. Sugary, spongy, currenty, Christmassy or grob switchy. It is the same with dreams. Right. Now then, do you have dreams about the Queen of England? Oh, lots of them. And about giants? Of course. And about giants eating people? Swiggles of them. And about little girls like me? Those is the commonest of all. I has bottles and bottles of dreams about little girls. And could you mix them all up just as I want you to? Sophie asked, getting more and more excited. Of course. But how is this helping us? I think he was barking up the wrong dog. Sophie said, listen carefully. I want you to mix a dream which you will blow into the Queen of England's bedroom when she is asleep. And this is how it will go. Now, hang on a minute, Tick. How is I possibly going to get near enough to the Queen of England's bedroom to blow in my dream? I'll tell you that later. For the moment, please listen carefully. Here is the dream I want you to mix. Are you paying attention? Very close. I want the Queen to dream that nine disgusting giants, each one about 50 feet tall, are galloping to England in the night and snatching little boys and girls from their beds. Let her dream that they will be reaching into the bedroom windows and pulling the little boys and girls out of their beds and then... Do they eat them on the spot or do they carry them away first? She asked. Hmm. Oh, they is usually just popping them straight into their mouths like popcorn. Put that in the dream. 
And then, and then the dream must say that when their tummies are full, they will go galloping back to giant country where no one can find them. Is that all? Certainly not. You must then explain to the queen in her dream that there is a big friendly giant who can tell her where all those beasts are living so that she can send her soldiers and her armies to capture them once and for all. And now let her dream one last very important thing. Let her dream that there is a little girl called Sophie sitting on her windowsill who will tell her where the big friendly giant is hiding. Where is he hiding? We'll come to that later. So the Queen dreams her dream, right? Right. Then she wakes up and the first thing she thinks of is, Oh, what a horrid dream. I'm so glad it was only a dream. And then she looks up from her pillow and she sees a little girl called Sophie sitting on her windowsill. Uh, how is you going to be sitting on the Queen's windowsill, may I beg? You are going to put me there. And that's the lovely part about it. If someone dreams that there is a little girl sitting on her windowsill and then she wakes up and sees that the little girl really is sitting there, that is a dream come true, is it not? Ah, oh, I is beginning to see where you is driving to. If the Queen is knowing that part of a dream is true, then perhaps she is believing the rest of it is true as well. That's about it. Mm, you said you was wanting the dream to say there is a big friendly giant who is also going to talk to the Queen. Absolutely, you must. You are the only one who can tell her where to find the other giants. I is not wanting to be shooted at by her soldiers. The soldiers are only in the front of the palace. At the back there is a huge garden and there are no soldiers in there at all. How is you knowing all this about the Queen's palace? Last year I was in a different orphanage. It was in London and we used to go for walks all around there. Is you helping me to find this palace? I has never dared to go hide and sneak in around London in my life. I'll show you the way. Oh, I is frightened of London. Don't be. There are very few people about in the witching hour. The BFG got to his feet. When is you wanting me to mix this special dream? Now, at once. When is we going to see the Queen? Tonight, as soon as you've mixed a dream. Tonight? Why such a flush-bunking flurry? Well, if we can't save tonight's children, we can anyway save tomorrow's. What is more, I'm getting famished. I haven't had a thing to eat for 24 hours. Then we had better get crackling. It was dark now. The BFG, with Sophie sitting on his hand, hurried into the cave and put on those brilliant blinding lights that seemed to come from nowhere. He placed Sophie on the table. Stay there, please, and no chittering. I is needing to listen only to silence when I is mixing up such a naughty, plexicated dream as this. He got out an enormous empty glass jar that was the size of a washing machine. He clutched it to his chest and hurried towards the shelves on which stood the thousands and thousands of smaller jars containing the captured dreams. Hmm, dreams about giants. He muttered to himself as he searched the labels. The giants is guzzling human beings. No, no, not that one. Nor that one. Ah, here's one. And here's another tipped the dreams into the enormous jar he was clutching, and as each one went in, Sophie caught a glimpse of a small sea-green blob tumbling from one jar into the other. The BFG hurried towards another shelf. Hmm, now, I is wanting dreams about giggle houses for girls and about boggle boxes for boys. Sophie could almost see the excitement bubbling inside him as he scurried back and forth among his beloved jars. Dreams about little girl. And dreams about me. About the BFG. Come on, come on. Hurry up. Get on with it. Now, where in the wonky world is I keeping those? In about half an hour, the BFG had found all the dreams he wanted and had tipped them into the one huge jar. He put the jar on the table. Sophie sat watching him but said nothing. Inside the big jar, she could clearly see about 50 of those oval sea-green jelly shapes, all pulsing gently, each one still a separate individual. Now we is mixing them, the BFG announced. He went to the cupboard and from it he took out a gigantic egg beater. 
It was one of those ones that has a handle which you turn, and down below there are a lot of overlapping blades that go whizzing around. He inserted the bottom end of this contraption into the big jar where the dreams were lying. Watch, he said. He started turning the handle very fast. Flashes of green and blue exploded inside the jar. The dreams were being whisked into a sea-green froth. After about a minute, the BFG stopped whisking. The whole bottle was now full to the brim with large bubbles. They were almost exactly like the bubbles we ourselves blow from soapy water, except that these had even brighter and more beautiful colours swimming on their surfaces. Quite slowly, the topmost bubble rose up through the neck of the jar and floated away. A second one followed, then a third and a fourth. Soon the cave was filled with hundreds of beautifully coloured bubbles, all drifting gently through the air. It was a truly wonderful sight. As Sophie watched them, they all started floating towards the cave entrance, which was still open. They're going out! Of course! Where to? Those is all little tiny dream bits that I isn't using. It's all a bit beyond me. Dreams is full of mystery and magic. Do not try to understand them. Look in the big bottle and you will now see the dream you was wanting for the Queen. Sophie turned and stared into the great jar. On the bottom of it, something was thrashing around wildly, bouncing up and down and flinging itself against the walls of the jar. Good heavens! Is that it? That's it. But it's... It's horrible! It's jumping about! It wants to get out! Ah, that's because it's a troggle humper. It's a nightmare. Oh, but I don't want you to give the Queen a nightmare. If she is dreaming about giants guzzling up little boys and girls, then what is you expecting it to be except a nightmare? Sophie stared down at the fearful nightmare dream that was still thrashing away in the huge glass jar. It was much larger than the others. It was jellyish. It had tinges of bright scarlet deep inside it. There was something terrible about the way it was throwing itself against the sides of the jar. I is thinking that your queen will be happy to have a nightmare if having a nightmare is going to save a lot of human beings from being gobbled up by filthum giants. Is I right or is I left? I suppose you're right. It's got to be done. She will soon be getting over it. Have you put all the other important things into it? When I is blowing that dream into the Queen's bedroom, she will be dreaming every single little thing a ling a ling you is asking me to make her dream. About me sitting on the windowsill? That part is very strong. And about a big friendly giant? I is putting in a nice long gobbit about him. As he spoke, he picked up one of his smaller jars and very quickly tipped the struggling, thrashing troggle humper out of the large jar into the small one. Then he screwed the lid tightly onto the small jar. That's it. Is you ready to leave? I'm ready. The BFG was putting on his great black cloak. He tucked the jar into a pocket in his cloak. He picked up his long trumpet-like dream blower. Then he turned and looked at Sophie, who was still on the tabletop. The dream bottle is in my pocket. Where is you going to sit? Sophie looked him over for a few minutes. Then she said, If you would be kind enough to swivel one of your lovely big ears so that it is lying flat like a dish, that would make a very cosy place for me to sit. By gumbo, that is a squackling good idea. Slowly, he swiveled his huge right ear until it was like a great shell facing the heavens. He lifted Sophie up and placed her into it. It was extremely comfortable. <laughs> you is tickling me a bit. <laughs> Please do not jiggle about. I'll try not to. Are we ready? <laughs> Don't do that. I didn't do anything. You is talking too loud. You was forgetting that I is hearing every little thing-a-ling-a-ling 50 times louder than usual. There is you shouting away right inside my ear. Oh, gosh, I forgot that. Your voices sounded like thunder and trumpets. I'm so sorry. Is that better? No! It sounds as though you were shootling off a blunderbuss. Sophie tried speaking right under her breath. Is this better? That's better. Now I is hearing you very nicely. What is it you is trying to say to me just now? I was saying 
Are we ready? We is off, cried the BFG, heading for the cave entrance. We is off to meet Her Majesty the Queen. The great yellow wasteland lay dim and milky in the moonlight as the big friendly giant went galloping across it. Sophie, still wearing only her nightie, was reclining comfortably in a crevice of the BFG's right ear. She was actually in the outer rim of the ear, near the top, where the edge of the ear folds over. And this folding over bit made a sort of roof for her and gave her wonderful protection against the rushing wind. The BFG went bouncing off the ground as though there were rockets in his toes and each stride he took lifted him about a hundred feet into the air. Sophie had not slept for a long time. She was very tired. She was also warm and comfortable. She dozed off. She didn't know how long she slept, but when she woke up again and looked out over the edge of the ear, the landscape had changed completely. They were in a green country now, with mountains and forest. It was still dark, but the moon was shining as brightly as ever. Suddenly, and without slowing his pace, the BFG turned his head sharply to the left. Look! Quick, quick! Over there! He said, pointing his long trumpet. Sophie looked in the direction he was pointing. Through the darkness, all she saw at first was a great cloud of dust, about 300 yards away. Those is the other giants, all galloping back home after their guzzle. Then Sophie saw them. In the light of the moon, she saw all nine of those monstrous, half-naked brutes thundering across the landscape together. They were galloping in a pack. Their necks craned forward, their arms bent at the elbows, and worst of all, their stomachs bulging, their feet pounded and thundered on the ground and left a great sheet of dust behind them. In ten seconds, they were gone. A lot of little girlsies and boysies is no longer sleeping in their beds tonight. Sophie felt quite ill. It must have been about an hour or so later that the BFG began to slow his pace. We is in England now. Dark though it was, Sophie could see that they were in a country of green fields with neat hedges in between the fields. There were hills with trees all over them, and occasionally there were roads with the lights of cars moving along. Each time they came to a road, the BFG was over it and away, and no motorist could possibly have seen anything except a quick black shadow flashing overhead. All at once, a curious orange-coloured glow appeared in the night sky ahead of them. We is coming close to London. He slowed to a trot. He began looking about cautiously. Groups of houses were now appearing on all sides, but there were still no lights in their windows. It was too early for anyone to be getting up yet. Someone's bound to see us. Never is they seeing me. You is forgetting that I is doing this sort of thing for years and years and years. No human being is ever catching even the smallest wink of me. I did. Ah, yes. But you was the very first. There were quite a few people about, and there were cars with lights on, but nobody ever noticed the BFG. It was impossible to understand quite how he did it. There was a kind of magic in his movements. He seemed to melt into the shadows. He would glide noiselessly from one dark place to another, his black cloak blending with the shadows of the night. Sophie and the BFG came at last to a large place full of trees. There was a road running through it and a lake. There were no people in this place, and the BFG stopped for the first time since they had set out from his cave many hours before. What's the matter? I is in a bit of a puddle. You're doing marvellously. No, I isn't. I is now completely boggled. I is lost. But why? Because we is meant to be in the middle of London, and suddenly we is in green pastures. Don't be silly. This is the middle of London. It's called Hyde Park. I know exactly where we are. You is joking. I'm not. I swear I'm not. We're almost there. You mean we is nearly at the Queen's Palace? It's just across the road. Which way? Straight ahead. The BFG trotted forward through the deserted park. Now stop. The BFG stopped. You see that huge roundabout ahead of us, just outside the park? I see it. That is Hyde Park Corner. Even now, when it was still an hour before dawn, there was quite a lot of traffic moving around Hyde Park Corner. 
Then Sophie whispered, In the middle of the roundabout, there is an enormous stone arch with a statue of a horse and a rider on top of it. Can you see that? The BFG peered through the trees. Are you seeing it? Do you think that if you took a very fast run at it, you could jump clear over High Park Corner, over the arch, and over the horse and rider, and land on the pavement on the other side? <laughs> Easy. You're sure? You're absolutely sure? I promise. Whatever you do, you mustn't land in the middle of Hyde Park Corner. Don't get so flussed. To me, that is a snitchy little jump. There's not a thing a ling a ling a ling to it. Then go! The BFG broke into a full gallop. He went scorching across the park, and just before he reached the railings that divided it from the street, he took off. It was a gigantic gigantic leap. He flew high over Hyde Park Corner and landed as softly as a cat on the pavement the other side. Well done. Now quick, over that wall. Directly in front of them, bordering the pavement, there was a brick wall with fearsome looking spikes all along the top of it. A swift crouch, a little leap, and the BFG was over it. We're there. We're in the Queen's back garden. Bye. Gumdrops. Is this really it? There's the palace. Not more than a hundred yards away, the massive shape of the palace loomed through the darkness. The sheer size of it staggered the BFG. But this place is having a hundred bedrooms at least. Easily, I should think. Then I is boggled. How is I possibly finding the one where the Queen is sleeping? Let's go a bit closer and have a look. The BFG glided forward among the trees. Suddenly, he stopped dead. The great ear in which Sophie was sitting began to swivel round. Hey, you're going to tip me out. Shh! Are you hearing something? He stopped behind a clump of bushes. He waited. The ear was still swinging this way and that. Sophie had to hang on tight to save herself from being tumbled out. The BFG pointed through a gap in the bushes. And there, not more than 50 yards away, she saw a man padding softly across the lawn. He had a guard dog with him on a leash. The BFG stayed as still as a stone. So did Sophie. The man and the dog walked on and disappeared into the darkness. You was telling me they had no soldiers in the back garden. He wasn't a soldier. He was some sort of a watchman. We'll have to be careful. Mm. I is not too worried. These waxy big ears of mine is picking up even the noise of a man breathing the other side of this garden. He glided forward through the vast garden, and once again Sophie noticed how he seemed to melt into the shadows wherever he went. His feet made no sound at all, even when he was walking on gravel. Suddenly, they were right up close against the back wall of the great palace. The BFG's head was level with the upper windows one flight up, and Sophie, sitting in his ear, had the same view. In all the windows on that floor, the curtains seemed to be drawn. There were no lights showing anywhere. The BFG stopped and put his other ear, the one Sophie wasn't sitting in, close to the first window. No. What are you listening for? For breathing. I is able to tell if it is a man-human being or a lady by the breathing voice. We has a man in there, snortling a little bit too. He glided on. He came to the next window. He listened. No. He moved on. This room is empty. He listened in at several more windows, but at each one he shook his head and moved on. When he came to the window in the very centre of the palace, he listened but did not move on. Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho! We has a lady sleeping in there. Sophie felt a little quiver go running down her spine. But who? The BFG put a finger to his lips for silence. He reached up through the open window and parted the curtains ever so slightly. The orange glow from the night sky over London crept into the room and cast a glimmer of light onto its walls. It was a large room, a lovely room, a rich carpet, gilded chairs, a dressing table, a bed. And in the bed lay a sleeping woman. Sophie suddenly found herself looking at a face she had seen on stamps and coins and in the newspapers all her life. Is that her? Yes. 
the BFG wasted no time. First, and very carefully, he started to raise the lower half of the large window as far as it would go so as to leave a place on the sill for Sophie to sit. Next, he closed the crack in the curtains. Then, with finger and thumb, he lifted Sophie out of his ear and placed her on the window ledge with her legs dangling just inside the room, but behind the curtains. Now don't you go tip-toppling backwards. You must always be holding on tight with both hands to the inside of the window sill. Sophie did as he said. The BFG was taking the glass jar from the pocket of his cloak. He unscrewed the lid. Now, very cautiously, he poured the precious dream into the wide end of his trumpet. He steered the trumpet through the curtains, far into the room, aiming it at the place where he knew the bed to be. He took a deep breath. He puffed out his cheeks and... Poof! He blew. Now he was withdrawing the trumpet, sliding it out very carefully like a thermometer. Is you all right sitting there? Yes. How long will it take to work? Mm, some takes an hour. Some is quicker. Some is slower still. But it is sure to find her in the end. Sophie said nothing. I is going off to wait in the garden. When you is wanting me, just call out my name and I is coming very quick. Goodbye. Suddenly, unexpectedly, the BFG leaned forward and kissed her gently on the cheek. When she turned to look at him, he was gone. Dawn came at last, and the rim of a lemon-coloured sun rose up behind the rooftop somewhere behind Victoria Station. A while later, Sophie felt a little of its warmth on her back and was grateful. In the distance, she heard a church clock striking. She counted the strikes. There were seven. With all the patience of a small girl who has something important to wait for, Sophie sat motionless on the windowsill. How much longer? she wondered. Faint stirrings and distant sounds came to her from deep inside the belly of the palace. Then, all at once, beyond the curtains, she heard the voice of the sleeper in the bedroom. It was a slightly blurred sleep-talker's voice. Oh, no! No, don't! Someone stop them! Don't let them do it! I can't bear it! Oh, please stop them! It's horrible! Oh, it's ghastly! No! No, no! She is having the dream, Sophie said to herself. It must be really horrid. I feel so sorry for her, but it has to be done. After that, there were a few moans. Then there was a long silence. Sophie waited. She looked over her shoulder. The garden was deserted. A pale summer mist hung over it like smoke. It was an enormous garden, very beautiful, with a large, funny-shaped lake at the far end. Inside the room, beyond the curtains, Sophie suddenly heard what was obviously a knock on the door. She heard the doorknob being turned. She heard someone entering the room. Good morning, Your Majesty. Will you have your tray on the bed, ma'am, or on the table? Oh, Mary, something awful has just happened. This was a voice Sophie had heard many times on radio and television, especially on Christmas Day. It was a very well-known voice. Whatever is it, ma'am? I've had the most frightful dream. It was a nightmare. It was awful. Oh, I am sorry, ma'am, but don't be distressed. You're awake now and it will go away. It was only a dream, ma'am. Do you know what I dreamt, Mary? I dreamt that girls and boys were being snatched out of their beds at boarding school and were being eaten by the most ghastly giants. The giants were putting their arms in through the dormitory windows and plucking the children out with their fingers. It was all so... so vivid, Mary. It was so real. There was suddenly a crash and a clatter of crockery, which could only have meant that the tray the maid was carrying had fallen out of her hands. Mary! the famous voice was saying rather sharply. I think you'd better sit down at once. You look as though you're going to faint. You really mustn't take it so hard just because I've had an awful dream. That... that isn't the reason, ma'am. The maid's voice was quivering terribly. Then for heaven's sake, what is the reason? You... you haven't seen the papers yet, have you, ma'am? No. What do they say? 
Sophie heard the rustling of a newspaper as it was being handed over. On the front page, ma'am, it's the big headlines. Great Scott, cried the famous voice. Eighteen girls vanished mysteriously from their beds at Rodian School. Fourteen boys disappear from Eton. Bones are found underneath dormitory windows. Then there was a pause, punctuated by gasps from the famous voice as the newspaper article was clearly being read and digested. Oh, how ghastly, the famous voice cried out. It's absolutely frightful. Bones under the windows. What can have happened? Oh, those poor children. But, ma'am, don't you see? Ma'am! See what, Mary? Those children were taken away almost exactly as you dreamt it, ma'am. That's why I came over all queer, ma'am. I'm coming over a bit queer myself, Mary. Shall I draw the curtains, ma'am? Then we shall all feel better. It's a lovely day. Please do. With a swish, the great curtains were pulled aside. The maid screamed. Sophie froze to the window ledge. The Queen, sitting up in her bed with the times on her lap, glanced up sharply. Now it was her turn to freeze. She sat there, staring wide-eyed and white-faced at the small girl who was perched on her windowsill in a nightie. The maid, a middle-aged woman with a funny cap on the top of her head, was the first to recover. What in the name of heaven do you think you're doing in here? She shouted angrily to Sophie. Sophie looked beseechingly towards the Queen for help. I don't believe it. I'll take her out, ma'am, at once, the maid was saying. No, Mary, no. Don't do that. The Queen spoke so sharply that the maid was quite taken aback. She turned and stared at the Queen. What on earth had come over her? Are you quite all right, ma'am, the maid was saying. When the Queen spoke again, it was in a strange sort of whisper. Tell me, Mary, she said. Tell me quite truthfully. Is there really a little girl sitting on my windowsill, or am I still dreaming? Well, she is sitting there all right, ma'am, as clear as daylight. Your Majesty is certainly not dreaming. But that's exactly what I did dream, the Queen cried out. I dreamt that as well. I dreamt that there would be a little girl sitting on my windowsill in her nightie and she would talk to me. The maid was lost. She had not been trained to cope with this kind of madness. Are you real? The Queen said to Sophie. Y yes, Your Majesty, Sophie murmured. What is your name? Sophie, Your Majesty. And how did you get up on my windowsill? No. Don't answer that. I dreamed that part of it, too. I dreamed that a giant put you there. He did, Your Majesty, Sophie said. The maid gave a howl of anguish and clasped her hands over her face. Control yourself, Mary, the Queen said sharply. Then to Sophie she said, You are not serious about the giant, are you? Oh, yes, Your Majesty. He's out there in the garden now. Is he indeed, the Queen said. He is a good giant, Your Majesty, Sophie said. You need not be frightened of him. I'm delighted to hear it, said the Queen. He is my best friend, Your Majesty. How nice, the Queen said. He's a lovely giant, Your Majesty. I'm quite sure he is, the Queen said. But why have you and this giant come to see me? I think you have dreamt that part of it too, Your Majesty. Sophie said calmly. That pulled the Queen up short. She certainly had dreamed that part of it. She was remembering now how, at the end of her dream, it had said that a little girl and a big friendly giant would come and show her how to find the nine horrible man-eating giants. But be careful, the Queen told herself. Keep very calm, because this is surely not very far from the place where madness begins. You did dream that, didn't you, Your Majesty? Yes. Yes, now you come to mention it, I did. But how do you know what I dreamed? Oh, that's a very long story, Your Majesty, Sophie said. Would you like me to call the big friendly giant? The Queen took a deep breath. She was glad no one except her faithful old Mary was here to see what was going on. Very well, she said. You may call your giant. 
No, wait a moment. Mary, pull yourself together and give me my dressing gown and slippers. The maid did as she was told. The queen got out of bed and put on a pale pink dressing gown and slippers. You may call him now, the queen said. Sophie turned her head towards the garden and called out. BFG! Her Majesty the Queen would like to see you. The Queen crossed over to the window and stood beside Sophie. Sophie jumped down into the room and stood beside the Queen at the open window. Mary, the maid, stood behind them. I don't see any giant, the Queen said. Please wait, Sophie said. Just then there was a rustle in the bushes beside the lake. Then out he came. Twenty-four feet tall, wearing his black cloak with the grace of a nobleman, still carrying his long trumpet in one hand, he strode magnificently across the palace lawn towards the window. The maid screamed. The queen gasped. Sophie waved. The BFG took his time. When he was close to the window, where the three of them were standing, he stopped and made a slow, graceful bow. Your Majester, I is your humbug servant. He bowed again. Considering she was meeting a giant for the first time in her life, the Queen remained astonishingly self-composed. We are very pleased to meet you, she said. Oh, Magister, oh, Queen, oh, Golden Sovereign, oh, Ruler, oh, Ruler of Straight Lines. Oh, Sultana, I is come here with my little friend, Sophie, to give you a... The BFG hesitated, searching for the word. To give me what? The Queen said. A assistance. The BFG said, beaming. The Queen looked puzzled. He sometimes speaks a bit funny, Your Majesty. He never went to school. I has great secrets to tell Your Majesty. I should be delighted to hear them, the Queen said, but not in my dressing gown. Have either of you had breakfast? Oh, could we? Sophie cried. Oh, please, I haven't eaten a thing since yesterday. I was about to have mine, the Queen said, but Mary dropped it. The maid gulped. I imagine we have more food in the palace, the Queen said, speaking to the BFG. Perhaps you and your little friend would care to join me. Will it be repulsant snozcumbers, Magister? The BFG asked. What is he talking about? The Queen said. It sounds like a rude word to me. She turned to the maid and said, Mary, ask them to serve breakfast for three in the... I think it had better be in the ballroom. That has the highest ceiling. To the BFG, she said, I'm afraid you will have to go through the door on your hands and knees. I shall send someone to show you the way. The BFG reached up and lifted Sophie out of the window. You and I is leaving her magister alone to get dressed. No, leave the little girl here with me, the Queen said. We'll have to find something for her to put on. She can't have breakfast in her nightie. The BFG returned Sophie to the bedroom. Can we have sausages, Your Majesty? Sophie asked. And bacon and fried eggs. I think that might be managed, the Queen answered, smiling. Just you wait till you taste it, Sophie said to the BFG.